I think that developing a culture of positive emotional health is probably now becoming one of the most important priorities. Children spend approximately a fifth of their week in the school environment. So if that environment is healthy from a psychological and emotional perspective, an environment where uh, young people feel they're able to talk about emotions, that they're able to express emotions, that there's a cultural respect within the classroom, then there's a strong possibility that a child will take that emotional health away with them. Some of the signs of mental health problems in teenagers can be, again, a kind of a change in behaviour that's uncharacteristic to what you would see over the lifestyle of, of what you, how long you'd know this child. But sometimes irritability, anger or uncharacteristic outbursts of, of sadness or upset or frustration that seem to be new and novel aspects of this young person. Um, it also may indicate that they, they might be becoming more obsessed and worried and stressed about certain things, well, albeit exams or school preparation. And you'll oftentimes also maybe describe some kind of disruptive behaviours in class. Maybe it's coming in late. You're also looking to observe things like tiredness, a child or a teenager who's not sleeping at night. Maybe their appetite might be a little bit less than it was, they may not be bringing in it's quite the same amount of lunches, etc. And you're also worried about their social interactions in terms of friendships, whether they're still partaking in sports and hobbies and activity that they customarily would be involved with in the, within the school. So these would be all signs, again, that would be a change in characteristic or something new for this young person. Most of the problems that we would see would not be a single problem. It would have lots of different effects on the person's personality overall. Parents will not see how adolescents behave when they're with other adolescents and there are no adults around, no parents around, but teachers will see it. So they will pick up things. They'll pick up lack of self-esteem, lack of self-confidence. They'll pick up social problems where people won't socialise as much as they should or avoiding things which parents cannot see by their very nature. What I would suggest is if a child or a teenager has an experience of isolation or irritability that doesn't seem to be getting any better, in fact is getting worse, and this prolongs over maybe a month that there seems to be a pattern or a trend to this, and you're genuinely concerned that this is affecting their development, then it is time to just ask a few questions. It may not be a major intervention that is needed at this time, but it may need to be brought up with them and a conversation maybe need to be had about how they feel they are and how they're managing. Every secondary school in Ireland will have a care team in place and if any teacher comes across anything that is unusual that causing them any kind of worry or concern whatsoever, they will give it inside the school to the care team. That care team will meet once a week normally and they will try to figure out what needs to be done to give that young person what they need. Now usually what that will be is they will contact the parents and they will explain to the parents where they're coming from, what they're seeing. And again, there is you know, a barrier, they're not mental health professionals. But they will try to explain what they're seeing and they will try to get the parents to work with them, to bring the young person to the appropriate professionals. The usual first step, once again, would be the GP who will know all the services available in the area. So you might remember two weeks ago we were talking about a history assignment I was going to get you to do. It's on famous people, any person of your choice. I'm actually going to set the deadline for the 17th of May and I'm going to set the word count at 300 words for your Wait, assignment. Sir, I already did it and I did 500. That's fantastic. Yeah, that's great. Uh, you've done 500? Yeah. Well, we can cut that down to 300. There's no problem there. There's more chance of getting an A if I do 500. Uh, not necessarily. Uh, don't worry about it. We'll I definitely cut it down. On it. Oh, well, that's fantastic. Well, I'll, I'll have a chat with you later about it, okay? Don't worry. Okay. Uh, you're going to need references. Uh, you're going to need to use quotations. So any books that you use. Yeah, what we see in the case of Daniel is a, a child who's obsessively preparing. Um, and he, in this case, seems to have done the assignment before the assignment was even given. And what you'll find is young people who are suffering with anxiety or worry will do that. They will read passages numerous times in order to get it perfect and they'll over prepare and perhaps do far more work than is necessary. Um, his reaction in this situation is interesting because his reaction is 
to get flustered, irritated and, and frustrated with the change of the goalposts in terms of the teacher's word count. Um, that's a normal reaction for anxiety. It, it would seem he's coming across irritable, he's coming across cranky, and he doesn't come across as your typically stereotypical anxious child, he's coming across as a bit stroppy. And anxiety in teenagers can be expressed as stroppiness, irritability, and sometimes hostility. Um, and what he's trying to do is he's trying to communicate that he's not coping, or he's not managing, or he's feeling overwhelmed. In this situation, you'd like the teacher, again, on a one-to-one, -to, -one, to try and you know, take him aside and, and ask Daniel how he is coping with various demands, whether it be schoolwork, home, sports, whatever he might be struggling with, and see if he can help him to try and you know, creatively timetable things a little better and trying to manage his expectations of himself. That in fact, you know, it isn't desirable to get things perfect. In fact, you know, it's about making a good enough go at something. And if this is earlier on in the year, it's about giving him context that you don't, you know, train for a marathon in a week. This is a process that takes time and trying to get him to think about the long game rather than the short game. But in this situation, it is just about supporting him, not reacting to the hostility and the irritability, because if you do that, you'll miss the worry that's most likely going on behind it. For young people, uh, being emotionally healthy involves uh, essentially three things. It involves being able to be happy, believing in themselves, or learning to believe in themselves, and then thirdly, feeling safe. So uh, you can see how emotional resilience is core to all of those things. And to, to try and overprotect our children and, and, and ensure that they don't experience trauma or, or negative things uh, is unreasonable. Uh, on the other hand, exposing them too much to negative experiences is also not going to be conducive. But they need to be able to cope and learn how to cope with difficulties and to enjoy the good times. And that's really what resilience is about. Have a willingness to open up the place for conversation. And you can open up that place for conversation and change a culture in a school or in a family uh, only by being able to accept the reality of stress and a difficult reaction to it. In that setting, a child who may be depressed now, or even unruly, or underperforming, or um, acting in a misbehaved fashion, acting out as we'd say, may even be a good thing. Because they're the child, they're the children that you might actually have the opportunity for the conversation to happen with. They're, in a way, able to send the message that the conversation might open up and if you provided the conversation opportunity there is an opportunity to have that conversation. I worry more about the kids who don't talk, the ones who are silent and don't tell their friends, the ones who are silent and don't talk on social media, the ones who maybe even continue to be rather good. It's probably um, true that they're also under stress but they're not having opportunities or access to that conversation. People, when I say this to them, say, but I haven't the training. I, I, how could I have that conversation? How, I, I'm going to do more harm than good, they say. The answer is no one is ever harmed by having the mental health conversation. But many people suffer because they didn't have the opportunity. And schools are places where that opportunity needs to be created. Stress in the school environment is normal. And again, I think what we notice in child psychiatry services is that we would see a trend of referrals around stressful times. You'd see peaks of referrals around September time and usually May, June around exam time. And so what we can decipher from that is that school is a stressful environment. And much of that can be around the social stressors or the academic stress or the state exam stress. What we can indicate from that is that stress is a normative response to life events. However, when stress becomes debilitating or actually disables a teenager's ability to cope, their ability to sleep, their appetite, those kind of physiological issues, and is is irrational to the event. So if I'm a second year doing a Christmas exam and I'm treating it like a leaving cert, then that child needs to be helped to manage that stress because what they're doing is they're over worrying. They're disproportionately reacting to something that in ordinarily should be much more manageable. So a child like that will need considerable scaffolding around trying to bring them back from where their worry is and where their anxiety and stress is. And they also need to be taught ways of managing stress. Just telling a child not to worry about something tends to not 
be very effective. But learning to live with uncertainty and tolerate the normal stresses and really bring that down to proportionately react to stress is, a, is the best option in terms of teaching stress management and, and ways in which young people can cope with the inevitables of school life. Okay, good. You've all got your homework out ready. Uh, Connor, homework. I didn't do it, sir. You didn't do it? Uh, is there a reason why? I just didn't have time. Didn't have time to do it. Really? Because now this is your third homework that you haven't completed and haven't brought into class, correct? Yeah. Is there a reason why three homeworks haven't been presented to me? I don't know. You don't know? Shrug your shoulders. Mm. It's disappointing. Your brother was never like this. Every single time homework was due, he'd bring it in. Every single time. It's very disappointing. Sorry. Again, Connor's situation is common. This is a, a young lad who's not bringing in homework, he's not performing, and we can assume by the teacher's disappointment that this isn't ongoing, this is more recent, uh, and it's prolonged. In fact, it's the third time that he hasn't been able to do it. The incidence of bringing in an older sibling, sometimes it's really challenging to come in the following in the footsteps of an older sibling who has thrived in your school because they've blazed a trail that you have to follow. Um, and what we oftentimes see, especially in teenage boys in that situation, is what we'd call a fear of failure. So it's rather, it's better to not uh, try something and fail because you didn't prepare, than prepare your best and not do well in it. Because if I prepare my best and put my best into it, then I become exposed for the limits of my capabilities. Whereas if I don't do it at all, then I just become a kind of a misunderstood hero. And in some respects, you know, you can hear mums hearing stories about, oh, you know, Coleman could have done anything, but he never tried. And we can go through our lives being that person. And oftentimes in the shadow of a, a superb sub sibling, that's something that's common. But the fear of failure is an issue and it's young people trying to opt out of being exposed for their, what they see as their inabilities. In that situation, a teacher is just about nurturing the person's ability their own self-worth, their value, and trying to feed back to them that whatever they produce will be enough and that it's enough for them and that they're not in competition with anyone else. In fact, they're in competition with themselves and bringing out the best performance that they can bring on the day is enough for everyone and should be enough for everyone. Before a person, a young person leaves the inpatient um, unit like ourselves in Willow Grove, we spend upwards of a month preparing them to leave because they're going back into a structure that they've been out of for a long time. Their friends have moved on, they've got all the fears about being behind academically, socially, what will their friends ask? The big one will always be what the teachers know, what, this, what does the principal tell the teachers when this young lad or young girl suddenly reappears? And they need to actually be clear in their own mind what they are going to say, what they want people to know, how they're going to say it. We will gradually reintegrate them. While they're still an inpatient, they'll go in on various days for three classes, four classes, it'll build up gradually. But the big thing for the school to know is that no one just leaves an, as an inpatient. For the next six months, year, 18 months, they will still be getting outpatient treatment. So the school does not need to become mental health professionals. All they need to know is there are mental health professionals still taking care of this person and they may need to miss a Friday morning once a month to go and see a psychologist or a psychiatrist, whatever. But there needs to be a process in place so that the teachers can literally feed back anything that they see unusual to the parents so that they can feed it back to the professionals. In response to a serious event for a student in teenage years, schools are really uh, in a precarious position in how they respond to that. And many teachers over the years, for example, in the case of a suicide, um, there's a real sensitivity in responding to that because there is the worry that an over-ceremonial response to that may glamorise the event um, and there's a worry that it becomes a contagion for other young people um, but there's a, a real need to respond to it for their pupils and their peers who've just engaged with a very significant loss in their lives that they're not 
emotionally or cognitively able to prepare for. Uh, I'm familiar that NEPS, the National Education Psychology Service, does have a response that can give some advice to schools and can come in and help schools in, in the event of a crisis. Um, again, I would think teachers themselves are going through their own grief. You'll be familiar with this child who, uh, who you've recently lost. So needing some external support can be useful in that event of someone who comes in and tries to protect you to do it. But again, I would think it's about the balance of acknowledging it, supporting the survivors of suicide in terms of their peers and friends, and putting something in place for them to gain support or speak to someone if they wish. The communal collective grieving processes are there for a reason. We, it helps us to come to terms with grief when we have a process, but it's about making that process uh, apt for the young people who are there and protecting them from uh, over, being over aware of the event uh, and overburdening them and overwhelming them. So it's a real kit glove response that I would encourage schools to get some support with um, and find some professionals who are more accustomed to unfortunately dealing with these events who can guide you as to how to respond to it. A teacher's role is crucial. We just have to reflect back on our own childhoods, on our own school experience, and we can all remember the teacher who spoke to us nicely, who gave us um, a compliment, who told us we were good at something, and that lasts. So the teacher's role cannot be underestimated. I think the, the real success of good teaching is when uh, a, a positive emotional um, learning and a positive emotional culture is integral to the teaching environment. I think teachers often underestimate their connection with young people that they have. Many times young people come to the clinic who are brought here by parents as a result of a, a teacher asking the right question. We know from studies in Ireland in the recent years that the most protective thing about for young people's mental health is having one good adult in your life, a good enough person who's interested in how you are and will be there to help you. In many situations that can be a teacher and you can play a pivotal role in uncovering someone's distress and helping them to seek help for it. There is a movement now in the UK to start studying the introduction of mindfulness, for example, as part of a school curriculum. And I think it's wonderful to start thinking of our education as more than a chase for points or particular academic achievements, but the formation not only of a whole human being, but a whole human being with mental skills. And that kind of conversation will emerge from a cultural change in the school that's committed to a conversation about the stress, about the distress, and actually a willingness to invite not just those who are noisy about that, but those who are at the back of the class and may be quiet about that. Teachers are absolutely crucial because tiny little details, they can boost self-esteem, they can do all sorts of things without even the young person being aware of it. So they are one of the key elements. Now they're not mental health professionals, they're not there to diagnose, but just in the normal run of the mill, they will actually be able to boost a young person's self-esteem and ego and all that kind of stuff very, very easily.